talking about finding quiet in a noisy soul. Definitely something that all of us uh, can apply to our lives. We've explained and explored the way down. We've kind of, the, the series that we've been looking at, broken into two portions. We have the way down, how our souls become noisy, and then, most recently, we started taking a look at the way back, or how to find a quiet soul. We talked about the way down. The way down is unbelief. Unbelief always leads to discontent. Discontent will lead to anger and or anxiety. Sometimes one, sometimes both, but always that's the, that's the order it goes. And if you spend enough time in anxiety and anger, eventually you'll end in despair. Despair being that idea that, well, I guess this is just how it is now. And that is not a good attitude to have. That is not, uh, not how we should look at life. God saved us to do more than live in despair. And I hope that you'll uh, pick up on that as we've been going through this. Last week, we talked about the importance of contentment. You'll see right here, you have the discontentment. Um, unbelief leads to discontent. When we have discontent, we're, we're setting ourselves up. Unbelief, and we'll talk about this a few more times even today. Unbelief, we call it a disorder. You remember why we call it a disorder? Because it's taking things out of order. Should be that I interpret life through God's word, and then I have my experience. What happens with unbelief is when I switch places and I put my experience, my opinions, above the word of God. That's leading to problems, and it's always going to lead to discontent. But then we talked about <clears throat> contentment. 1 Timothy 6, 6 says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay. That's, that's not to say that if you're content, you'll get everything you want. But if you're content, you'll understand that you have what you need. And God is good in doing that. Jeremiah Burroughs gave us a definition of Christian contentment, he calls it this way. He says, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit. All of those adjectives right there are very important, okay? It's that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of mind which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. It's me understanding that God loves me and that he's a good heavenly father and just as i according to scripture if i being evil know how to give good gifts to my children how much more does our heavenly father know how to give good gifts to his so today we're going to start off beholding the god of love because this is part of the way back we want to be content we also need to have a good understanding of the god of love now we carry pictures of our loved ones. How many of you if, you, if you carry a wallet, you remember those those that little clear things that go in there? I remember it used to be back in the day, if somebody wanted to show you a picture of their grandkids or their kids, they would, right, and they've got this long picture list of, well, this was them, and this was them when they were a baby, and they're, they're 30 now, and we're going to go through this whole long transition of their life. Why? Well, because they love that person, right? Now we have, we've gotten rid of that, which I, I guess it's okay. And we've gone, to, we've gone to having it on our phones. And so if somebody says, hey, do, do you have grandkids? That's a good way to get into a conversation, right? They say, do I have grandkids? And they'll pull out their phone, and they've got videos and slideshows and pictures and all of this stuff. Why? Why do you have pictures of your grandkids? Because you love your grandkids. It makes sense. Now, here's something. We, we also, we have our pictures. And maybe you have a favorite picture of your grandchild or of your spouse or of your parents or even grandparents from years gone by. And you have a favorite physical picture. But also, when I say grandma, you have a picture that comes into your mind of your grandma. Or of, if I say grandpa or whatever you call your grandfather or your, your grandparent, there's a picture that comes into your mind. If I were to say the name of one of your children, there would be a picture that would come into your mind. 
and it's different for all of us, uh, you, you have a way that you remember your father. Maybe it's him uh, carrying a fishing pole, going down to the river. Maybe it's of your mom, and she's standing in the kitchen. She's pulling a pie out of the oven. Maybe it's your wife as she walked down the aisle at your wedding. Maybe it's your child with chocolate icing spread from ear to ear, looking at you with a bunch of missing teeth. It could be any number of things, but you have a mental picture when I say a name. You, you think, I... I know them, and it, it brings up to mind a picture. And while we think of all these mental pictures that we have of relatives and friends, we also need to realize, and this is a, a tremendous thought. I would encourage you to take it throughout the day. You have a mental picture of your kids and your loved ones. You also have a mental picture of God. You have in your mind, when I say God, there's something that happened. Now, it, it's not a physical picture, probably, okay? Because God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 1.18 tells us that no man hath seen God, speaking of God the Father, at any time. So it's not a picture of God in that way, but you have an idea of God. There's something, when, I, when, I get, when you get to church... And you start thinking about God, or you're going through your day and you think about God, or you're singing a hymn or listening to one, there's a mental picture that you have of God. Again, not physical appearance, but who he is. Now, I'm going to do something that I don't often do. I'm going to read a quote, okay? I'm going to read an extended quote. It's too long for me to put up on the screen. So I need everybody to agree that you will listen throughout the entirety of this quote. Okay? It's very, very good, and it will help as we move forward with this idea of looking at the God of love. Will you pay attention? Will you, will you stay focused in on my quote here? Okay. I know it's hard because I've sat where you're sitting many, many times, and the pastor starts into a quote, and you watch your lunch. Okay? Don't do that. Stay with me here. Okay? Here's a quote. It's from A.W. Tozer. Okay? He wrote a book called The Knowledge of the Holy. Here's what he said. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Were we able to extract from a man a complete answer to the question, what comes into your mind when you think about God? We might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. The man who comes to a right belief about God is relieved of 10,000 temporal problems. For he sees at once that these have to do with matters which at the most cannot concern him for very long. Among the sins to which the human heart is prone, hardly any other is more hateful to God than idolatry. If you look back at the Old Testament, God judged his people severely for idolatry. For idolatry is at bottom a libel of his character. When I worship something else instead of the God of the Bible... It's making a statement what I think of him. It's libel to his character. The idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than he is, in itself a monstrous sin, and substitutes for the true God one made after its own likeness. Let us beware, lest we in our pride accept the erroneous notion that idolatry consists in kneeling before visible objects of adoration, and that civilized people are free from it. The essence of idolatry, hear this, the essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. Idolatry is not just a shrine with physical statues and little incense burners and people in orange robes. That's not all idolatry is. Idolatry is a civilized sin. Idolatry is a sin that all of us have a propensity towards. If we're honest, all of us have a, have a tendency to go towards having in our mind and entertaining thoughts of God that are not worthy of him. What Tozer mentions about being able to see a man's mental picture of God and being able to predict his proneness to worry, to anxiety, to discontent, it's a powerful thought. 
If somebody sees God as not fully in control, what are they going to think when they get a bad diagnosis? They're going to, they're not going to be worshiping this God. Rather, they're going to be worshiping a God that they designed. A God who doesn't care. And that's dangerous. That's the exact opposite of what we should do if we're looking to eliminate the noise from our souls. There are several ways that we can get a mental picture of God. Again, not of his, his physical form. God is a spirit. He, he shows himself, he reveals himself in light. Okay? But we don't have a, a, a picture of God. But from Scripture, we can understand about God. We can, have, we can draw some of his characteristics. We know from Scripture that God is a God of perfect balance. God's attributes are never heavy on one, but light on another. Let me explain. God is holy, but God is loving. Both of those are balanced. God's holiness would say that he cannot have fellowship with sin. That would condemn us to hell for all of eternity because all of us have sinned. But God is loving. How has he shown his love? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's balance and it's perfect. God is just. Yet God is merciful. God is our judge. But he's our father. There's, there's perfect balance to God. Our mind, our understanding, sometimes our experience would cause us to go off on a tangent. And we would say, well, well, we serve a God. And he's, this, he's the judge. And he'll bring down the hammer on you. And we have this picture in our mind of God. Okay? And a lot of times if we do have a picture, a physical picture of God, we got it from a cartoon. Or, or a comic in the newspaper of an old man with a long beard and long hair and white robe is where we get our, our picture of God. That's blasphemous, by the way. But we have this picture of God, and he's, he's standing over on the parapet of heaven with dark clouds, and he's got lightning bolts, right? You're, you're familiar with this, right? We've, we've all seen this. And that's our picture of God, that he's waiting or God with a massive hammer, he's waiting for you to mess up. And as soon as you do, he's going to bring down the hammer on you. That's our picture of God. If we allow ourselves to go off on a tangent, does God have justice? Has God ever rained down fire from heaven? Yeah. He certainly has. He will again. But his balance is always there. In scripture, God gives us a picture of himself. The Lord is my shepherd. That's a picture that we can have. Because God is a spirit, he gives us some, some physical pictures that we can say. He's not an actual shepherd uh, with, a, with a robe and a, and a curved staff. No, but he is the shepherd of our souls. He is He's our father. We can understand this. He's our rock. We understand that. And so that gives us a picture. So from Scripture, we can draw a, a picture, a mental picture of God. But here's what also happens. We, we can also draw a mental picture from our experience. And this is where people fall into a, a, a host of issues. We suffer a loss, and so our picture of God is that he is unloved. If God was loved, he wouldn't have allowed this to happen. We suffered abuse as a child. We picture God as harsh, perhaps because our, our physical father was a harsh person. We picture God in that way. That's wrong. That's using, that, in its essence, is unbelief. That's me getting my picture of God from my experience rather than the word of God. I should be getting my, my picture of God from right here. We're discouraged, and so we picture God as distant, apathetic, or uninvolved. I've, I've talked to many over the years who've had this, well, yeah, I believe there's a God. I just don't think he does anything for us. I think he just kind of, he's just kind of there. That, that's making God in my own image. That's not interpreting scripture. <coughs> the definition of unbelief.
And we take our experience and elevate it above the Word of God. One sign that you have a false idea of God, I could even say it this way, one sign that you're worshiping a false God <coughs> is when you start asking questions that sound like this. Well, if God is loving, I wouldn't have to deal with... Do you see the problem in this sentence? You see the problem in that question? If God was loving. The, the, another, if God cared about me at all, he'd have given me. This, this is a sign. If God is really good, he'd surely empty out the cancer wards at the hospital. If God was really good, then he wouldn't. Do you hear the problem? That's me saying, well, I, I know I'm not God, but I could tell him how to improve a little. If he listened to me, I could tell him what to fix so that he'd be a, a better God. That's worshiping a false God. That's idolatry in its essence. I'm worshiping a God who isn't God, but rather a God who is of my own design. If you have your Bibles, open up to Romans 8. Romans 8, we're going to get there in just a moment. Let's talk about the love of God, because that's one of his defining characteristics. God's holiness, God's love, two very defining characteristics. The author says in, in the book that we're going through, he says, It is interesting that no attribute of God is more evident in Scripture than his love. Yet no attribute of God is doubted as quickly when life is challenged than his love. When everything's going great and life is smooth sailing and I come up to you and I say, hey, does God love you? You say, oh, yes, of course God loves me. Then things take a turn for the worse. And what happens? Well, I don't know if God loves me. I, I, I think maybe he dropped the ball on this one. It's idolatry. Romans 8, if you're there, take a look at verse 31. Verse 31. Listen to this. Listen for love of God in here, okay? What should we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I, I want to pause right there. We're going to go back in just a second. God proved his love for you at the cross. There is no question. There can be no question. I think I've given the illustration. If, if you were in a, in a situation where you were going to die, but in, through, through some set of situations, I saved your life, but it cost the life of my child. That's the, that's the height of love right there. If, if I would sacrifice my child to save you, do you think I would hold back from giving you anything in my wallet? If I would give my daughter, do you think I'm going to hold my credit card back and say, well, <laughs> I mean, let's not get extreme here. No, I've already been extreme. If I gave my daughter, if I gave my child, there's no higher form of love. And yet... God gave his son. And how is how dare we as, as people say, well, I, I just don't think God loves me because he, he let such and such happen. His love is unquestionable if you're looking at Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yes, sir. I think even the world, I know I can say with certainty or a degree of certainty that each and every one of us have had experience where we feel that something or we wanted something or felt we needed something and later on in life we see where that something would have been a detriment and I think the world sees that also the non-Christians for lack of a better term yeah. I think they admit that and I think each and every one of us have had acquaintances that people have said that to us. Yeah, yeah. If, if we got everything that we asked for, we'd be in a world of hurt. But God loves us, 
and he withholds from us. Absolutely. He, he gives us and he also keeps back from us. Each and every one of us, if we got what we deserve, where, where would we be this morning? We wouldn't be here. We'd, we'd be in hell. If we got what we deserve, but God loves us. He loves us so much, not only am I not in hell, I'm, I'm here. I'm with people I love. I have a family who I love. I have a ministry that God has, God has entrusted. I have a great life for me to question God's love because I hit a rough patch is idolatry. That's me having a poor picture of God in my mind, a picture that, that I drew instead of a picture that God drew. Take a look back here in, in Romans 8. Look at verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. <laughs> What's Jesus doing right now? He's, sit he's sitting at the right hand of God, and they're talking about you and me. Pretty awesome. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Does God love you? Yes. He does. Did he prove it? Yes. At the cross, and, and many times since then, he's proved his love for you. And he's proved his love for me. A full realization of the truths that we just read there in Romans 8, 31 down through verse 39 will have a tremendous stabilizing influence on your life. It will bring stability because if we have this feeling that God loves me, things are good. God doesn't love me right now. Things are bad. And life could be defined by going back and forth between good things and bad things, couldn't it? It's, well, right now I've got this going on. Oh, i got a health problem. Well, things are going pretty good right now. Oh, got a, I've got a family problem. Well, things are going pretty good right now. And it's just back and forth all through life. This truth, you can understand things are going, you're going to have ups and downs in your life. But God's love remains absolutely constant through all of it. God's love never increases. God's love never decreases. God, his love is perfect. If it's perfect, it can't get better because that means it wasn't perfect. If it gets less, that means it's not perfect anymore. It is absolutely perfect at all times. We're going we're gonna to bring this truth out in just a minute, but I'm going to steal some of my own thunder. How about your behavior? Is your behavior like this? Is it, is it good at all times? Are you walking in fellowship with God? Are you just, you're just the, a rock of a Christian. Do you just, this perfectly straight line, is that you? Anybody <laughs> want to raise your hand? I don't know. No, that's not any of us. Why? I, what's our Christian life look like sometimes? Like this. Okay. So our Christian life is doing this. Sometimes we're close to the Lord. Sometimes we're close to him for a while. And then we, we kind of fall away for a little bit. And then we have a dark time. But what does his love look like? All through our this, what does his love look like? It's perfect. It's not that, well, they sin, so I guess I don't love them quite as much. That's not how it works. We have a perfect God who loves us with a perfect love at all times and it's not tied to my behavior it's tied to his character and his character is unchanging it's perfect Ephesians 3 verse 16 
describes what happens when we have a grasp of God's love for us. When you and I understand that God's love is perfect and stay and steady, it'll have this effect. Verse 16, Paul's talking to the, the Ephesian believers, and he says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. He's praying, Lord, have the Holy Spirit just give them that strength. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. To know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Let me give you an illustration of this. Uh, last week. My brother and his family, his wife and five kids, came down to visit. They have their youngest, her name is Courtney, and she's just three years old. And uh, while they were there, we walked over towards our garden. And so as we were walking over to our garden from the house, we decided we'd let the dog out. We have a golden retriever who's two years, year and a half now. And uh, he's, he's a full-size golden retriever, and he's, he's a very nice dog. Okay? So we let him out. And the kids play with him for the most part. Our kids play with, her all, with, with him all the time. But, but all of a sudden, my brother's youngest got scared. She started crying. It was weird because we were just walking. We let the dog out. And she was over here. The dog was over there. And she started crying. You know how, you know how three-year-olds can cry when something's wrong? Okay. She started into that. I thought maybe she hurt herself. And then I realized she's upset about the dog. Now, in, in her defense, the dog outweighs her probably two or three times. She's not a very big little girl. And so the dog's a lot bigger than her, whereas uh, she, she's probably looking him kind of right in the eyes when she's standing flat. But he's, he's a big dog. My daughters and I, we tried to explain to Courtney, that's her name, we tried to explain to Courtney, no, honey, he's... He's real friendly. He loves playing. He's, he won't hurt you. He wouldn't hurt you for the world. And, and he wouldn't. But do you think she believed us? <laughs> Not a little bit. No, she just kept crying. And he would come over, and he's got his big tail wagging, his big tail that's half as big as she is, and it's wagging. And she's scared. And she runs to my brother, and my brother picked her up. And guess what happened? She, she stopped. She stopped crying, and over the next little while, she and Carhartt, our dog, kind of formed this tentative friendship. Here's how it worked. She needed to be in my brother, whose name is Wes. She had to be in Wes's arms, or she had to be on the other side of a fence. Okay? But she was in my brother's arms, and if, if she was in Wes's arms, then my brother could get down, and he could pet the dog, and she'd be okay. W why? B because she was safe, right? She felt that security. My brother is bigger than the dog. But so am I. But you know what? <coughs> it wouldn't have made a difference if I would have picked up my niece and held her and gotten down. She would have been very upset. Because why? Because I'm not... Daddy, I, I'm not her father. It wasn't just a matter of size. It's not that a stranger could have walked off the street and picked her up and she'd have been okay with the dog. It had to be dad. It has to be dad because she knows her dad and she's confident he's not going to allow me to be harmed. I'm safe from a perceived danger because my daddy has me. Do, do you see the correlation here? It's, it's pretty plain. In similar fashion, he says in their book, the man who knows that God is powerful but does not yet really know God's love will still be feel, filled with fears. In fact, Having a God who is supremely powerful is no comfort at all if you don't think he likes you. <laughs> do, do you see that? <clears throat> if you understand, God, he, he can send lightning. He, he has sent.
sent hailstones that took out armies. He, he can strike people dead. Do, do you see how that could lead to fear if I didn't think that he loved me? It makes all the difference in the world when I understand the God of Scripture is the God I worship. Not the God who I've fashioned after my own design, who I've made in my own image. Let's talk about the essence of God's love here briefly. What, what is the love of God? Well, we're going to break it down into two parts, really. God's love is part of God's goodness. That God is good means that God is excellent. When I say to you, God is good, and you, there used to be a God is good all the time, and there was a response, all the time, God is good. It's true. When I say to you, God is good, I'm, I'm attributing excellence to him. Excellence is this sense, in, in this sense, is defined as his complete perfection in answering to the ideal. If I were to say to you, this is a good truck, what does that mean to you? It means it runs, right? It means it's in working condition. If I was to say to you that, that this is a good marriage, what would you think? Would you think that means that things are as they should be, that things are in God's order? If I was to say, this is, I have a good job, you'd, you'd understand that to have a quality of excellence. God is good in all of his attributes. We talked already about his love. It's perfect. It's steady. God is good in wisdom, meaning he's excellent in wisdom. Therefore, I can trust his decisions. If, if God wasn't good, God is, if God it wasn't good, then it would lead me to have some pretty major uh, misapprehensions, wouldn't it? God is good in righteousness. Therefore, we trust that his commandments are best. God knows more than you do. It's a comforting fact. That God knows more than you do means I can rest in the fact that he'll do what's best in any given situation. Problems may arise when we begin to define excellence according to our expectations. When, when I say, I don't think God is good because of what happened in my life. We're running into a problem. The author again gives a, a, a good illustration of a girl who came to the college where he works who'd come from an extremely wealthy family. Look, like extremely wealthy. She lived under a governess, okay? So a full-time, part of the family type babysitter. And this governess had done everything for this young lady. She had drawn her bath and laid out her clothes and curled her hair and, and prepared food for her and all of this. It was, it was the life in the lap of luxury. Well, this girl came to, to college, Bible college, and, uh, and she had a roommate. Guess what she wanted her roommate to do? <laughs> yeah, she expected, well, of course my roommate is going to draw my bath and lay out my clothes and curl my hair and, and prepare food for me. And because the, do you think the roommates wanted to? No. No, it didn't work, didn't work that way. So she thought, she went to the, to the, the higher ups there at the college and she said, I don't have good roommates. Now she might have had great roommates, but what was the problem? She was defining good not as an independent quality. She was defining good by her own experience. I had a good thing at home. I come here. I don't have that anymore. Therefore, these people are not good. That's the same thing that happens to God when we try to define God by our definition of good. Well, if God was good, again, you hear the problem right out of the gate. The first word of that sentence, if God is good. No, God is good. Set it, put a period right there. Okay, And since God is good, I understand that he will only give me what is best for me. God is good at being God. God is better at being God than you and me. Aren't you glad that God doesn't 
from time to time hand over the mantle of responsibility to you? How would you do at being God in, in answering prayer, in, in, in keeping nations from overrunning one another? And then you get down on a cosmic sense. How would you do with keeping the universe, keeping the atoms from splitting apart? Anybody here qualified? God's good at it. He's, he's always been God. He's always been good. He's excellent in all aspects of being God. And when I start trying to give God unsatisfactory marks, I'm guilty of the idolatry that Tozer mentioned earlier, making a God of my own design and of my own image. My, my picture, my mental picture of God is off. And that's going to lead to problems. That God is love and that God is good also means that God is benevolent. God is benevolent. Not only is he good, he's good to me. He's good to you personally. On a personal level, God's good. Doubt of this truth has led to problems before. A, a story that you're very familiar with from Genesis 3. L listen to this. This is Eve talking to the, to the serpent in the garden. Verse 1 of Genesis 3 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said? What did he just do? Yeah, yeah. He questioned God's, God's word. Did, did God really say that, Eve? He's questioning God's word. Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So did you hear what he did first? In, in verse 1, he questioned God's word. What did he do here in verse 4? He denied God's word. Hath God said? God hath not said. <clears throat> that's, that's still Satan's tactic, but listen to this. He says, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Here's what he says. Did God really say that? God didn't really say that. God's holding out on you. God's not giving you what is best. God, God knows that if you eat of this tree, then you'll be like him. And he doesn't. He's holding out on you. Do you see how that produced instantaneously a wrong picture in the mind of Eve? She had gone from God has given us all this to God hasn't given me this. An understanding of the goodness of God will change our perspective. Eve bought into the lie that God isn't good. Psalm 84, 11 says, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Meaning what about the things I don't have? It means they're not good, at least right now. The things that I don't have are not God's will. And God is good. And God is loving. And God is excellent. And for me to doubt that is for me to fall into idolatry. Again, God's goodness, God's love is not conditioned on our deserving it. If God's love was conditioned on my deserving it, I wouldn't be here. And neither would you. Matthew 5, 45 says, For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. I was talking with Janice earlier before the service about how, how it seems like sometimes God splits the rain that goes around Wayland, but he does give us rain. He gives rain on the just, on the unjust. If God only gave rain to just farmers, how many would have crops? None. <laughs> none. There's none righteous. No, not one. In Christ is the only hope we have. God gives rain to everybody. He causes the sun to rise. You don't have a selective sun, sunrise and sunset because, oh, I'm good. No, God gives that to all. Because why? Because God is loving. He's good. Psalm 145, 9 says, The Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. All his works. God is good. 
Psalm 33, 5. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. God's been good. Not just in a cosmic sense. In a personal sense. God's been good to me. And God's been good to you. Psalm 107 recounts the goodness of God to Israel. It's kind of a history lesson where they just walk down through. They think about how deserving they are. I want you to think about how deserving Israel was of God's goodness. Was God good to, good to Israel because they deserved it? No, no. no, they were brats, just to be real blunt about it. When they were out in the wilderness, are we there yet, Moses? Why did you pull us out of Egypt? Is it because you wanted us to die in the wilderness? Moses, we're hungry. Moses, we're thirsty. They didn't deserve God's goodness. Why did God give it to them? Because he is good. Not because they were good. Psalm 107 verse 43 says, Whoso is wise and will understand these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. You read through scripture. I read through scripture and I read through the Old Testament especially. And I think, I can't believe God puts up with these people. You ever thought that? And then you walk past a mirror and you think, if you're honest, I don't understand how God puts up with me. I, I'm not consistent. I don't walk with him like I should. My, my Christian walk looks like this from time to time. And yet God's goodness is perfect because God is love. God is good. God is excellent. Psalm 103 verse 10 says, he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Charles Spurgeon, a man who was a, a, a preacher years gone by, he said, If any man thinks ill of you, do not be angry with him, for you are far worse than he thinks you to be. <laughs> well, that's kind of convicting, isn't it? No, I'm a good person. No, we're not. Don't kid yourself. You know you, and I know me. God, his goodness to me isn't contingent on my good behavior. And I'm so glad for that. We serve a good God. God knows the very worst there is to know about you. And he loves you anyway. God knows the things about you that you haven't told anybody. And he loves you. He's given his abiding presence. His indwelling spirit. He's given fellowship with believers. And when we die, we get heaven too. That's a good God. That's a loving God. God's love is his personal communication to a rational creature of his benevolence by giving himself to the highest good of the creature. God's love was self-sacrificing. God's love was demonstrated. It's free to you and me, but it wasn't cheap to him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So what's the picture you have of God in your mind? When I say God, you have something that pops up in your mind. A mental picture of God and his attributes. All that we looked at this morning is based in scripture. It's not just made up. It's not experience. God is loving from scripture. God is good. God is excellent. God is benevolent. But when we dismiss these truths, when we the truths that we've just talked about, when we dismiss these truths and we say, but my experience, what are we guilty of? Take a look at the way down here. What are we guilty of? When we take God's word, we give it a second place seat, and we say, my experience says that God is, what are we guilty of? Unbelief. unbelief. And what is unbelief the beginning of? The way down, you're on your way towards discontent, anxiety, and anger, and despair. It's very, very important. Maybe now, that, that phrase that we read at the beginning, that one of the most important things about a man is the picture in his mind when he thinks about God. Do you get your picture from here or from your experience, your life? It makes a difference in finding quiet in the midst of a noisy soul. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a good God, that you are loving, that you're excellent, that you're benevolent. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us for the idolatry that comes upon us so easily when we interpret who you are by our experience 
rather than by your word. I pray that you help us to walk close to you so that we can know you better and know you more deeply. I pray that you would bless each and every one as we seek to, to walk close to you, to understand and to appreciate your love and your kindness and your goodness to us. I pray that you'd bless now as we prepare for the main service. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts as we go through your word and as we pray, as we sing. I pray that you would receive worship in every aspect. In Jesus' name, amen.